So uh, it's been a busy news day, I know. So uh, I thank you all for making time to come out and listen to this webinar and participate with us in this important conversation. Uh, this doesn't get this information doesn't get as much wall-to-wall -wall news coverage as something like a Supreme Court hearing, but we really do believe that this is an issue that is every bit as important in terms of the protection of our democracy. So uh, this information is not anything new. It's been around probably about as long as information has been around. But what we're seeing right now is communications technology innovations are vastly increasing the reach and power of disinformation, uh, making it possible to flood more media markets and, and to reach more people with lies or exaggerations and to really help shape a narrative that uh, is planned and propaganda. Uh, it's, to me, as someone who studied strategy and uh, you know, wartime history, it, it reminds me of the concept of the storm of steel when machine guns hit the battlefield and you could put so much ammunition downrange that uh, armies could no longer march in tight formations, they had to dig trenches and it just completely changed the way warfare operated. Well, uh, communications technology now has gotten to the point that you can similarly flood the information warfare battlefield uh, with information, disinformation, and you can, it's completely changing the way that we think about disinformation. So it's kind of with that in mind, seeing the, the increased reach extent and power of this information that Stand Up Ideas decided to enter the fray and see if we couldn't figure out a way to help blunt the power of disinformation. Before we dive into the specifics of the project, I just want to introduce some of our panelists who will be participating today. Um, we're going to be joined by Molly McHugh, who is Stand Up Ideas board member, the CEO of Fiana Strategies, and an expert in information warfare. He's going to help provide us with an overview of information warfare, especially as it relates to the 2016 elections and to attacks that are ongoing today. We're also joined by Adam Schaefer, who is the founder of Evolving Strategies. Uh, that's the company that conducted the research and field testing of our video products. Uh, and of course, we'll also be joined by Mindy Finn, who is the co-founder of Stand Up Ideas. Uh, she's a former Republican political strategist and a social media and technology entrepreneur who's worked with some of the major social media and information communication companies like Twitter and Google. Mindy is going to provide an analysis of the project and the major lessons that we have learned uh, through this process. One kind of procedural note, if you have any questions, I encourage you to, uh, to share them with us using the Q&A button on the bottom navigation screen of the webinar. Here you can type in a question, and uh, what we will do is we will periodically go through those questions, uh, and if there are any questions, and we will answer them as best we can, um, and we will have a longer uh, Q&A portion at the end of the webinar uh, where we'll try and get to as many questions as possible. So with that, I am actually going to turn over the conversation to Molly McHugh, who, uh, I clicked the wrong thing, okay. Molly McHugh, who, as I said, is the CEO of Fiona Strategies and a general expert in social media, uh, weaponizing social media, information warfare, and uh, Kremlin strategy. Uh, so without further ado, Molly, I hand it over to you. All right, great. Um, thank you so much. I uh, don't know exactly how to use this app, and I'm late getting on the call as it is. So instead of delaying further, I'll just run through um, a few key concepts. And if there's anything that you guys are um, more interested in hearing about than not, I'm also happy to take um, uh, any questions later or send additional information. Um, uh, I think there's we're sort of used to hearing these kind of standard talking points about disinformation from the last year, um, about what it does, what it targets, what the goals are, that the Kremlin is trying to achieve chaos as sort of these big blanket uh, terms, you know, chaos, division, uh, exploiting weakness within American society. And all of those things are true, but I think it's helpful to sort of dig into that a little bit because I think it's actually sort of counterintuitive. 
Um, I think the core thing that we all need to think about, and I think you're going to get great info from the team today about how to start approaching this um, and the work that they're doing to contribute to this, um, is the idea that information defense is a human-led process. Um, you're going to hear a lot from the platforms about how AI and algorithms are going to fix these problems. Um, but in fact, that is uh, not really the case. Um, this is about people and people using these tools and tactics and weapons to attack other people uh, quite purposefully at times. And um, I think that that's sort of a key thing to understand that, that what we do um, needs to be uh, this human-led process. Um, so I think, um, you know, in 2016, there's been a lot of analysis about what was going on. Um, but the real bottom line is that just about every person and institution failed in defending uh, American citizens from being attacked directly by hostile foreign uh, information operations. Um, this process has not stopped. It is ongoing. There are other countries getting in on this game. There are non-state actors getting in on this game. And there are actors on the far left and far right in the United States uh, using the same types of tools and tactics. Um, if we don't learn how to combat these things more effectively, I think we're in um, a much uh, a much worse place than we than we think. Um, just very briefly on sort of the Kremlin side, um, and I'm, I have a presentation that I'm happy to send and have shared with you. Um, but there's sort of some core concepts in the way that they approach information warfare. Um, the Kremlin has an ideology of uh, either guerrilla warfare or asymmetric warfare, but the idea of using tools of the weak against the strong. They know that head to head with the United States, they have neither the economy nor the military strength to fight us. Um, but if you're creeping around in the shadows and uh, targeting our citizens uh, and our institutions in other ways, that there's um, a relative ability to succeed. But the idea of conflict in the information domain um, has become a primary means of power projection for the Kremlin um, and for other actors as well. Um, it used to be thought of as sort of the initial phase of a conflict, um, but now it's thought of as a way to achieve the goals of political warfare without having to get into other conflicts. So it's not, we sort of think of when we're talking about trolling and bots and sock, sock puppets and you know fake accounts, Sometimes it seems a little cartoonish and like something that's easy to dismiss or it's just silly activity. Um, but when you uh, operationalize that into hostile psychological operations with deliberate intentions of division and conflict, um, that's a very different thing than some silly comments posted on social media. And I think um, I have a long piece coming out on this, hopefully in the next couple of days. Um, but will be in Wired, but looking at some of the conspiracy theories that we have seen um, really uh, sort of flourish across a very specific American social media scene, um, but things like Pizzagate, QAnon, Gamergate, um, the Seth Rich conspiracy, um, all of these things are sort of tied together by common narrative themes and architecture. Um, and uh, it's, it now has like a permanently entrenched sort of pipeline to distribute information to a specific group in the United States. And I think that's the thing that's important to understand is that once this architecture is established, uh, it doesn't go anywhere and it's very easy to use. Um, there's sort of much more military terminology I can get into, but I think I'll skip it. Um, I think the, the key thing to understand is there's like this very cynical approach uh, from people who are using information operations and psychological operations against other people to achieve political goals. But the belief that, that you can uh, manipulate people on a very individual basis in order to achieve what you want. Um, and we've been very focused, obviously, on the United States. Some of us have probably read more uh, as well about Brexit and the role of the same types of tactics in, in the Brexit vote. Um, but none of us have really had time to dig into the more expanded universe, which is how these same types of tools have been used in elections in Africa, in Asia, to keep um, less democratic governments uh, in charge uh, of their countries. Um, and I think we really need to understand that we're at the edge of a precipice in terms of uh, is democracy still real if people are voting based on things that aren't real? Um, it's a very uh, deep well to look into, <laughs> but I think it's one that we need to discuss. Um, so I think uh, understanding that social media is both a means of communication, but a means of power projection for, for state adversaries. 
a means of intelligence gathering, um, a means of, of sort of recruitment and operation, uh, running operations. Um, these are very, uh, very significant asymmetric tools that are now available to just about anyone who can afford them and the way they're being used um, is sort of multiplying against American citizens who have pr proven themselves to be particularly vulnerable to these types of tools. Um, social media, these types of campaigns on social media have been used to build insurgencies. They've been used to take down governments. They've been used to game stock market prices. Um, there's a lot of different ways that that we need to start thinking about disinformation as having a real and serious corrosive impact um, uh, on our society beyond just sort of reputation management issues and, and disparagement and other things. Um, I think there's a lot going on that, that, that warrants more attention. My, my experience is primarily in the space closest to Russia where we've seen these tools evolve over the last decade. Um, and uh, I can tell you they're very real and very significant. Um, I don't wanna take up too much time from the, the agenda that everybody has. So I think I'm gonna stop there for the time being. Um, but if you wanna do questions or I can just share the longer uh, presentation uh, to transmit to you guys, I'm happy to do that as well. Great, thank you very much, Molly. Uh, it was very helpful. Um, and we will, again, if, you, if anyone has questions, for Molly or for anyone else uh, throughout the panel, feel free to type them into the Q&A section and we will uh, get to them when we can. Um, I, so the, Molly, that was a very helpful background um, and kind of a, a, a you know, 10,000 mile view of the, the landscape that we're facing in terms of information warfare um, and, and the many ways that, it can, that social media can be weaponized. Uh, so this is this is what we as an organization at Stand Up Ideas we're looking at, and we're um, obviously work with a lot of people, a lot of people who are uh, participating in this webinar as well, who are looking at different ways to address uh, this information to combat information warfare. A lot of those efforts are understandably being placed at places like increasing sanctions against countries who are engaging in these kinds of activities. Or, uh, of course, we have the Mueller investigation, which is a very important part of fully understanding and vetting how these attacks occurred throughout 2016 and whether or not anyone was uh, involved, any Americans were involved in that process. Uh, obviously, a very important part of it. And there's people who are working on social media and on policies internal to platforms about how they detect or combat or minimize this information. And as Molly suggested, there are people who are working on AI that they think might be able to help or might be able to um, combat this problem. We came at it from a different angle, uh, as Molly said, recognizing that this is uh, ultimately a, a very personal and human endeavor. Uh, what it's very easy for people to think about this information and the attacks on our election in 2016 when we talk about them as being very abstract, very far away, uh, and not recognizing the reality of the situation, which is that it impacts them personally and they're directly targeted. And beyond just being directly targeted by the attacks, people are being turned into tools to help spread and legitimize the, attack, the attacks. And that really creates kind of this exponential nature of disinformation attack because Somebody sees it, they believe it, they share it, and then maybe three or four people that they share it to see it, believe it, share it, and it grows and grows and grows. Well, one thing that we we think is an important thing to keep in mind is that that kind of exponential power and capability also means that if we can stop 15, 20% of people who would share disinformation from sharing it in the first place, that, that might that really has that same exponential dampening effect then, because now that disinformation is not even getting in front of some people who might share it. So you don't have to reach everyone, you're never going to reach everyone. But if you can severely tamp down the percentage of people that might engage with disinformation, you really can have a larger effect on it. So we engaged in this project um, of creating a video series that really highlighted the fact that so much of these, the news and the misinformation and disinformation surrounding cultural flashpoints in particular uh, and targeting social outgroups 
that these were part of a broader foreign enemy attack on our country, and that really the people who are watching these videos are the ones who are the best people to stop. Just like the See Something, Say Something campaign really increased uh, homeland security by getting citizens involved as a line of defense, that's really what we were hoping to do. So we created a series of videos that highlighted the fact that these were part of an attack on the United States, but also highlighted real examples of disinformation that were used during the, the 2016 attacks, but also even before that. Really emphasize and drive home for people that you play a role in defending the country against these attacks. Uh, to that end, we created these videos and then we decided that we needed to see if they actually worked, if people were actually influenced by these videos. And for that, we turned to Adam Schaefer and his company Evolving Strategies takes a, an unusual approach to testing materials like this. It's not just focus group materials. I'll let him dive into uh, their process, what they did. But Adam's gonna take you through uh, an explanation of the process of the research. He's gonna show the videos that we are discussing right now so that uh, you can see what we actually created. And then he's gonna walk through a lot of the big results that we got. So with that, I'm gonna go ahead and turn it over to Adam Schaefer. Adam, are you there? I am, thanks Mike, and uh, thanks for everyone coming on here. Can you hear me? Yes, yes, you're coming through great. Okay, great. And um, as Mike said, uh, mentioned, uh, I'm going to be going through a presentation, a, a shortened presentation here um, uh, compared to what uh, I believe will be made available after this with a bit more detail. There's also a data app where you can explore the details of, uh, uh, of the project results um, and all the demographic breakdowns and, and different measures that we looked at. Um, again, uh, as Mike, Mike stated, uh, we were looking to test three videos that uh, Stand Up Ideas produced uh, permitting what we call responsible skepticism. Um, uh, essentially uh, getting people to be a bit more skeptical about what they see on social media and headlines um, uh, and, and a bit more reluctant to share that with other people. A uh, bit about my background, I have a, a political science degree, political psychology and American politics. And what we do is uh, what we call clinical message, message trials. Um, uh, same as a clinical drug trial, random assignment as a core aspect of the methodology. Instead of asking people, we uh, randomly assign people to either a test group or a placebo group. Uh, the placebo group gets uh, the message equivalent of a sugar pill. And the test group gets the message we're testing. Uh, we observe the outcomes between the uh, placebo and the test groups and the difference between those groups is a true impact of that message. So we're not asking, hey, what do you think about this message? Is it gonna make you less likely to share um, uh, the information? We actually observe people's um, uh, responses after being exposed to it compared to a, a placebo control group. So it's just like a clinical drug trial, except for we test messages, not drugs, and uh, uh, call it a clinical message trial. In this case, we recruited uh, over 1,600 trial participants, approximating a national sample, randomly assigned them to either a, a placebo control group or one of the three treatment groups. Um, in each case, uh, a respondent only saw one of the videos. They otherwise answered all the same questions. Then we analyzed the impact uh, uh, and uh, looked at demographic subgroups to see if there are differences between them. I'm going to uh, play just a, a very short bit of the control message so you can get a flavor of it. Essentially, we're just looking for something that has no political content that's going to prime people in terms of the outcome measures. Okay, <laughs> mattress commercial. Now we're on to the first uh, video that was tested. Uh, MS-13 is a focus on uh, immigration. Um, uh, information about immigration. And we're going to play the full video for this one. The bookends, the beginning and the ends are the same for all the videos. The middle part has a focus on, on different content areas uh, in each of the three. So the, the two after this will start at that different content. Hey, Adam, real briefly, sorry, uh, if you could pause real quick. Yes. Uh, I don't think your 
sharing the audio. Ah, uh, that I'm is, just... yeah. Is um, there something I can do on my end to? Um, yes. <laughs> Hi, folks. Uh, there. I think it might be under the share option for the, there should be a share computer audio as well. Okay. Let me look at this real quick. One second here. Here we go. And hopefully. And okay, hold on for one second here. It was uh giving me a security issue here. Hmm. Let's try this again. Uh, can you hear me? Yes. Yes. Okay. Uh, I'm going to try to play this. I'll start it over again. Oops. Still not hearing any audio on it. Ah. Um, let me try this one more time and uh, otherwise. Let me try taking out here. Um, Information warfare there we go. across the internet. You may have seen emails and links with subject lines like crisis at the southern border or MS-13 is taking over the school. They're meant to intimidate and scare, but they're also based on misinformation and exaggeration. America's adversaries want to spread frightening stories and oftentimes invent them entirely to blur the lines between reality and propaganda to confuse and manipulate us. We know Moscow spread false information to influence the 2016 election. They're still at it, and they're only getting more clever. How can you stop it? Arm yourself against their attacks. Research stories, check sources, call out propaganda for what it is. This is a fight for America's independence, and you are on the front lines. So think before you call. Now, um, I'll show you uh, the Sharia treatment message. Uh, again, we're starting after that, that intro part and we'll stop before the, uh, the, the bookend on the, on the uh, backside of it as well. Internet. Many websites have falsely claimed that Muslim Sharia law is ruling American cities. This misinformation spreads like wildfire, especially on social media. One story got so popular that Dearborn, Michigan had to issue a press release condemning it as false. America's adversaries see this as an opportunity for disinformation. We know Moscow spread false information to influence the 2016 election. They're still... And the final message, uh, Black Lives Matter, KKK is the content. In 2016, Russian operatives went so far as to create fake accounts posing as both Black Lives Matter activists and counter-protesters, all to drive racial divisions in America. They posted outlandish and untrue positions, fostered stereotypes, and organized confrontations, all in order to keep Americans hostile to one another. In one case, Kremlin-backed internet trolls organized two competing race-oriented protests in Houston, encouraging them to battle in the streets. They're exploiting cultural divisions in order to weaken and further divide us. <laughs> How can you stop it? 
then uh, the uh, all this information will be uh, available to you afterwards. So I'm going to try to get through this um, uh, uh, fairly quickly and uh, leave enough time for questions at the end. Um, our primary measures of responsible skepticism asked respondents to agree or disagree with three statements about a series of news headlines. We'll show you those headlines after this slide here. They're asked to agree or disagree. The headline is believable, the headline is likely true, and the headline is likely exaggerated. And we considered a respondent to be skeptical if they disagreed with the first two and agreed with the last one, that it was exaggerated. Uh, the headlines, uh, we took uh, two from each video, uh, a total of six of these. Uh, there's an illegal immigration crisis at the southern border. Uh, MS-13 is taking over the school. City in Michigan first to fully implement Sharia law. Unbelievable how Dems push America's first Sharia law. Black Lives Matter thugs blocking emergency crews from reaching hurricane victims. And the KKK has infiltrated uh, police departments for years. Um, the impacts uh, in terms of the analysis, we're going to start first with the generalized impact. And what we uh, present here, we averaged all 18 outcome measures uh, for the headlines to create a comprehensive measure of responsible skepticism. Uh, so this will be the percentage of correct answers given by a respondent across all those uh, different measures that we laid out there. Uh, this should give us a, a good sense of how well these messages are, these, each message is working across even other content areas that weren't mentioned in the video. Do they have an impact beyond, say, immigration for the MS-13 video or beyond Sharia-related headlines uh, for that video? Uh, first, a general message uh, performance here. Um, again, here, uh, this is the combined measures, so uh, percent answering the correct, um, in the correct way across all these measures. If you look at the x-axis on the left uh, side, the control, uh, point estimate starts uh, at about 61% um, in that purple line. As you follow it up, that's the MS-13 video, and then Sharia, and then Black Lives Matter, KKK, and this indicates where those groups ended up in terms of the percent responsible, responsibly skeptical. As you can see, a very significant movement from the uh, control to the MS-13. Um, uh, if you look at the dot being filled in there, that indicates it's statistically significant movement. That means we, we can be very confident that this is a real movement and not simply noise uh, due to different samples. Um, it moves from about 61 to just over 66%. And all of the messages are um, statistically significant. Um, MS-13 appears to be the most broadly effective there. Here's another breakdown by education. As you can see, like with men and women, very broadly similar movements. Uh, of course, they start at different points, uh, but the uh, impact of the uh, messages are broadly similar. And again, MS-13 is, is um, uh, the one that's performing best. Uh, we will have available a much, much greater breakdown in terms of the uh, demographics, but I wanted to move into the more interesting results. Here we have uh, the, the, uh, uh, the sample broke down, broken down by party identification. And independent here means pure independence, people who don't lean one way or the other. So it's a fairly small group, about 10%. As you can see, the purple line Democrats uh, are impacted significantly by the MS-13 message, but, but not the others. And we really see most of the movement among Republicans uh, who are broadly affected about equally by all three messages, about six to eight points in terms of movement on responsible skepticism, which is, is pretty impressive. Uh, the, the, the huge movement really, and the big distinction we found here, which we did not necessarily expect, was between Trump and uh, non-Trump voters, uh, people who preferred Trump in 2016. As you can see here, the purple line, non-Trump voters, uh, basically no movement, and very, very significant movement and broadly significant movement across all three messages for Trump voters, uh, plus, 18, plus eight to 11 points. Breaking it down by ideology plus uh, uh, preference for Trump in 2016, you can see here huge movement, uh, especially among moderate Trump voters, plus uh, 14 to 20 points. And um, uh, just really remarkable, did not expect to see that big of movement. And we even see significant movement among conservative Trump voters. Uh, 
Um, this, uh, I have to, to, to say here, is not something that was, uh, ne we necessarily expected. Um, there is some evidence in political science and elsewhere that people being presented with um, facts or arguments counter to their prior beliefs can sometimes cause that person to become more entrenched and, and committed to a particular position. So um, uh, the backlash effect is real oftentimes with these kinds of efforts. Um, here we see a broadly effective uh, movement here. So the key takeaways, the MS-13 video is the most broadly effective. Um, all of them though are uh, effective and uh, uh, do have effects beyond their particular content area. Respondents who preferred Trump in the 2016 respond most and most consistently. And again, moderate Trump voters uh, are, are the best target group. Um, even conservative Trump voters, however, are moving in uh, to a significant degree, are, are moving in response to these messages. Thought we'd go through just a few of the impacts on the particular um, headlines that we tested, so you could get a sense of how those, uh, those might differ. Um, we're only showing the answer to uh, agree that a headline is likely exaggerated. And here you can see there's a, a very big separation between Trump and non-Trump voters um, uh, in terms of uh, whether they think uh, the headline, there's an illegal immigration crisis as the southern border is exaggerated. We do get significant movement from Trump, voter, Trump voters, not on non-Trump voters, um, but that gap persists. Here we see a different headline. Uh, the results for MS-13 is taking over the school. Much more dramatic movement. In fact, Trump voters catch up with non-Trump voters. Um, huge movement, about 20 points here. Um, all messages, all three messages are uh, uh, very sign statistically significant. Um, the next set is for the Sharia law ones. Again, here, huge movement, uh, about 25 points for the Sharia treatment. And uh, Trump voters not only catch up, but uh, actually exceed non-Trump voters in terms of um, their skepticism, uh, whether this uh, headline is exaggerated. Again, we see the same pattern here, catching up and even exceeding. Uh, the one exception here, the uh, BLM, uh, KKK treatment does not seem to be as effective in this, in this instance. Thugs blocking emergency crews. Again, here we do see movement, uh, but not as significant as the other two subject areas, uh, not statistically significant for Trump voters. KKK has infiltrated police departments for years. Interestingly enough, the only one we find significant movement on is the MS-13 um, message, not the BLM KKK message, which dealt with that um, information in particular. So again, just to reiterate, the MS-13 video most uh, broadly effective, but all three are effective, especially with Trump voters, and in particular with moderate Trump voters, although even conservative Trump voters where we might uh, most expect to find that backlash or resistance, uh, even in that case, um, in, in that uh, demographic group, we do find significant movement uh, uh, across a number of me um, uh, measures. Um, with that, I can hand it back over to Mike for uh, managing the Q&A and look forward to that discussion. Great. Thank you very much. Um, let me pick back the screen here. Yeah, thank you, Adam, for, uh, for running through that. Um, pleasure. I think that's uh, it's a really helpful uh, look at analysis. Um, I, just to, to highlight and reiterate uh, what Adam said is is for some of those messages there was really incredible and broad movement towards a kind of responsible skepticism of the types of headlines which are frequently used in uh, disinformation and information warfare attacks. So uh, it really shows that there is some room to persuade people and to make people more wary of what they might share. And, and the other thing, the other big high line I want to point out before I hand it off to Mindy Finn here is that watching just one of those videos, you know, if you watched the MS-13 video, it increased, it increased for a lot of people their skepticism of outrageous headlines about Sharia law or about Black Lives Matter protesters, right? So, so it wasn't just specific to the one issue that they watched that video. 
that the education, and this is really, I think, the, the, a lot of the weight of what the research shows, is that the education initiative, even if it's on one specific issue, had broader impacts on building skepticism across issues. I just wanted to jump in there and, and kind of echo that, Mike. Um, you know, we do a lot of work on policy-oriented messages and political messages, and, and it tends to be that whatever you're talking about, you have an impact on. And it doesn't travel very far outside of that in terms of related policies or concepts that you think might go together. So find, finding this bleed over in terms of an impact and really significant impacts outside of the issue area was another surprise for us. Um, uh, generally speaking, we expect on policy to have a, a fairly narrow and targeted uh, effect. Great. Thank you, Adam. Uh, with that, I, I'm going to turn it over to Stand Up Ideas co-founder Mindy Finn. Uh, this was a, a project that she helped shepherd through from every step of the way, and uh, she felt very passionate about. So um, she's going to have some great insights on what, what this all means. And with that, I will hand it over to you, Mindy. Great. Thanks, Mike. Uh, really appreciate you moderating this conversation today. Thanks, Adam, for giving an overview of the research. And I also want to thank Molly McHugh for her advice on the project along the way and for lending her expertise in describing the disinformation tax on our elections in 2016 and, and what's ongoing today. Uh, we all know that attacks and disinformation pose a serious threat to our democratic process and our national sovereignty. Uh, you know, disinformation is hardly an uncommon tactic in politics and war, but what we're witnessing today is the weaponizing of these ubiquitous social media platforms to amplify the reach and impact and also often to do so without transparency. In fact, the seeds for this project were actually planted, uh, for me at least, in 2016 uh, like throughout the election, I had uh, I worked closely with the Democracy Fund, uh, who had won. This was in the summer of 2016. Who really wanted to understand how much nativism and racial animus was kind of driving this surprise support, you know, for for Donald Trump. It was the the effort was to understand. Um, because it was based on not an electoral outcome necessarily, which we couldn't predict, but concerns about you know the country being further divided along kind of racial and cultural lines and trying to understand in particular where um it seemed like some of the animus was was based on uh non-facts so false information or one could say alternative facts now uh, and it wasn't quite clear where it was all coming from so i'm not going to go deep into that research but but essentially we did a lot of in-depth interviews with voters in a series of states, uh, as well as a poll to kind of dig into where it was coming from. And we also had these voters keep a media journal. And one thing that kept coming out was a lot of citations around fears, even from people who did not live in areas where there was heavy immigrant populations or was MS-13 is a problem, uh, actually like pretty homogeneous areas, we would hear from voters that they, you know, they would cite things that they were concerned about related to Sharia law or MS-13 or Black Lives Matter, even when it was not in their own backyard. And when we would dig into the media habits of these voters and try to understand where this was coming from, particularly when it was incongruent with their experience, they, they often reported not in, uh, actually consuming that much media or being aware of consuming that much media, but they did spend a lot of time on, on Facebook. And, and then, of course, after the 2016 election, uh, we learned a lot more about, um, you know, the, the disinformation was in, and propaganda was not something that was just used as a tool by political campaigns, something I think we're all familiar with. There's spin and there's, you know, contortion of, of fact, but the, there was actually a, a hostile or an adversary who was using disinformation on so, and social media platforms to divide us and to have an impact on the election. And we started to think through what could we do about this. As Molly described, obviously the platforms are looking at algorithmic changes and there's, um, you know, there's other solutions, sanctions, and those kinds of things so to deter foreign adversaries from engaging in this activity. But this is a human problem. And so if we were to run a, a massive PSA campaign to help educate those most vulnerable to spreading this disinformation, 
could that be impactful? How could that address the problem and to what extent? Thinking about in particular, the voters that, you know, clearly this issue is not just one that's isolated to the right. Um, even in the 2016 election, we know now that the Kremlin was also trying to divide the left um, in their primary process. They invested a lot more energy in the right. Um, and, but clearly this is a problem that's not isolated to one side. But for our purposes, at least initially, what we've tried to focus on is targeting a set of voters that we thought would be compelled. You know, Yes, they may be more likely to share some of these messages or they've been proven more likely messages related to MS-13 or Black Lives Matter, you know, a lot of the fear about um, demographic change or immigration, but, um, but they do care a lot about national security or at least historically have. And so we took this approach with our messaging and, uh, and consulting a bunch of experts initially that would say, that would educate them about the idea that information, that disinformation is warfare and that they as individuals are being weaponized uh, to serve the interests of hostile, hostile foreign powers and to give them some tools to avoid being weaponized and, and to fight back and to, to call, you know, kind of a call to arms for them. And as you can see with this content, that's what it does. And then it also uses specific examples in this series, each individual video, uh, about how this was done in 2016 on issues like MS-13, Sharia law, Black Lives Matter, et cetera. Uh, as you heard from, you know, from Adam and, and Mike has reiterated, we've been really pleasantly, um, we've, we've felt good about the results. I wouldn't say we were surprised. We thought we were on the right track and we had gotten some initial feedback from experts. But it's good to see as a result of this research that we were able to, um, to create responsible skeptics in consuming this information, and not just on that one issue, but really across the board. Um, this is preliminary in terms of where we, you know, where we go from here. We would like to take what we've learned from this research and make some necessary, you know, small tweaks to, to this initial content, but essentially to run a larger scale campaign as opposed to just a test at the lab um, that's delivered and targeted at, at those we think that um, both are most susceptible to this kind of disinformation, but also the most movable. Um, I'll just kind of reiterate, you know, as Adam detailed, we saw significant movement towards skepticism from Republican slash Trump voters, that was the biggest movement. The video on MS-13 was the most successful at creating skepticism. Uh, viewers of one video, as Mike and Adam have said, tended to demonstrate more skepticism to disinformation on, across the board. These are all really promising uh, results. And it's easy to think of, you know, uh, Kremlin attacks in our election as something that's happening to our country and not to us as individuals, but it is happening to us as individuals. We're all targets and possibly tools of those attacks. And at Stand Up Ideas, you know, we, we believe strongly that truth and the ability to discern truth is a cornerstone of democracy and human flourishing in the world. That once we lose that, we begin to lose our democracy. And it's absolutely critical in a place that's dedicated to, to self-rule and to liberty that our, uh, our citizens, that our voters are able to discern uh, truth from, from falsehood. And we certainly hope that this project is, um, go, goes a, a long way ultimately uh, in its next phases to helping Americans do just that. With that, um, Mike, I'll, I'll turn it back over to you to, I think, potentially take some questions or, or to turn it back, turn it over to Greg to give a little even more, uh, more of an overview about where we, we plan to take our anti-disinformation efforts. Thank you, Mindy. I, I think we should go to Greg uh, right now just to talk about, you know, we're in a good spot to talk about going forward, um, you know, ways that we can engage in this area. And uh, Greg Spension, our uh, policy and partnerships director, is here to talk about that. Great, thank you both. Um, 
Yeah, no, I'll, I'll make this really quick. I'm cognizant of time limitations. And I just want to thank you all for joining us on this. Um, as Mindy was saying, this is sort of uh, the first step in what we're hoping is going to be a pretty broad disinformation project that we're running. Uh, this project is stemming out of the working group that we've been running on uh, media in general. Uh, our ultimate goal is strengthening media's future role in democracy. Uh, due to its important role as gatekeeper, as arbiter of information, especially in this age of communication. Uh, so what we're hoping to do is to have this broad disinformation project where we get uh, different experts from different backgrounds together, uh, give them a platform to share their information with people, uh, to share their expertise, to uh, give essays on the psychology of disinformation, uh, the political science, its impact in the world, uh, all these different kind of perspectives that come together and give you a full and clear picture of this environment. Uh, because when we talk about disinformation, a lot of times we just talk about one vector. We talk about the Russian attack in 2016, or we talk about um, how it's done, but we never get the full and clear picture of it. And what we're hoping to do is to put together a platform to do just that. Uh, this is sort of a jumping off point for us on this, and it's still in its initial stages. Uh, but we've brought Alex Howard on board to do this. Uh, Molly McHugh is involved, Justin Hendricks from the New York City Media Lab, um, and many others that, that we're uh, currently bringing on board. So we're hoping this is going to be both a written and an online project. Uh, the written portion will consist of a variety of essays that are just going into these topics in great detail. Uh, giving these experts the opportunity to share what they know. Uh, the online version is going to have a lot of visual interactive effects, sort of like the videos that you just saw, illustrating disinformation tactics and how they work. Um, and then at the end of it, we're going to uh, roll it out all together. It should be a, a complete package where uh, you can kind of uh, read these different essays. You can go online, you can interact with the experts and things like that and get a pretty good sense of what we're up against and the entire scope of the challenge that is facing uh, media in, in an open society like this. So I think that's, uh, that's probably a pretty good overview for now. Um, Mike, if you wanna go ahead and, and take some questions or I'd be happy to take questions on our project plans as well. Sure, thank you, Greg. Um, we'll, uh, we have two questions kind of in the hopper. Uh, the first one we'll handle right now is from Justin Kirk. He wants to know, at the grassroots level in rural Colorado, how best would you attempt communicating the dire situation we find ourselves in? Uh, I'm gonna go ahead and take kind of a, a light first stab at that before seeing if any of our other panelists uh, want to weigh in. Uh, one thing I would say is, is that one of the reasons that I think that these videos were successful is because they were not overtly partisan, uh, even though we kind of targeted issues that were flashpoint issues that were leveraged predominantly by the Trump campaign, um, or, or more accurately, were leveraged by, um, you know, Kremlin agents to benefit the Trump campaign. Uh, the, the, the videos that we prepared focused on like the real nature of the conflict and the program, uh, the attacks that were being run against the United States. And, and I think by focusing on that way, we avoided that backlash that Adam talked about where people tend to just uh, shrink back into their own preconceptions, are unwilling to change their mind. So I, I think, you know, one thing I would say is, you know, you have to be able to separate, when we're talking about disinformation, a lot of people, um, I think actually the president included, uh, hate admit that it happened because they feel like it's an attack on everything they believe in or it's undermining it saying calling them dumb or saying that you know that their political party shouldn't have won or what have you and uh, I think when you're trying to convince somebody that these things are happening that the attacks on our elections are very real and very dangerous you have to divorce it from the and it's difficult but you have to divorce it from the actual politics that are going on at the same time. That's my two cents. I'm, I'd love to hear some of the other panelists, if any other panelists uh, wants to weigh in on that question.
I mean, I would just say this is Mindy that, uh, you know, this type of messaging and what we have in these videos, we believe is a tool to be used on, um, you know, an individual level. So essentially these types of materials are those that we would hope people are, are sharing to help educate those in their networks uh, or some message along those lines. Again, we'd like to continue to, to you know, develop more media literacy tools and do additional testing, but these preliminary results from this test shows that these are effective tools for helping uh, communicate to, you know, to people on a, on a regular level. Uh, you know, these are accessible messages. They're not academic, um, not messages to appeal to academics or, or experts in this area, but to, to just to, to Americans across the country that we find ourselves in a dire situation and to, to call them to arms to be part of the solution, to not allow themselves to be weaponized, but instead to be part of the solution. That's, that's a good point. Um, we have one more question which come in uh, that I'd like to get to. Uh, Will Fries, I believe. Um, he has asked, have you seen any type of activity like this on the sub-national level, such as the city level, for example? Um, Molly, if you're, if you're uh, still able to chime in, I'd be curious, uh, since you've done a lot of research in this area, if you've seen it on that kind of a micro level or if it predominantly sticks to national levels. Well, it, it's an interesting question. And um, uh, there are definitely some examples of... Uh, races that are state races where there's been a lot of uh, either disinformation or automated or troll activity. Um, the Roy Moore election was a good example of that. There's been a lot of good documentation of what was going on. Um, I've never seen it on sort of a below state level, um, but that doesn't mean it doesn't exist. It just means I don't have a good example of it handy. Um, there's been a lot of uh, state focused issues that um, accounts that we follow, that we believe are connected to various kinds of Russian architecture are engaged in. The accounts that were most effective in um, the 2016 campaign tended to be um, the false profile accounts that were sort of branded as real Americans. So there's like the group that's super Texas focused, there's a group that was really California focused, um, there was some Iowa, but they have these sort of very branded uh, sort of personas that are meant to make them seem like authentic Americans. Thus, some of them are very uh, locally based uh, profiles. Um, there's there's more of these bigger theme issues that they've weighed in on as well. Uh, you know, the earliest stuff that we were watching on what is this crap happening in the American information landscape and why does it look like it's so connected to Russia uh, was around the Standing Rock and Keystone XL and... Um, uh, Dakota Access Pipeline protests. So starting in whatever that was, 2013, 2014, um, there was a lot of weird stuff happening um, in that space um, that I would love to be able to go back and get the data for and take a better look at. Um, but uh, so the answer is yes, there have been sub-national issues that there have been intense disinformation campaigns um, targeted against. Um, and I think the, the best example uh, of that, that in terms of like, you know, this exists is the weird separatist campaigns that have been run, uh, you know, Texas secession, California secession, whatever. Um, but if you look at some of the really good, uh, the really good documentation that's been done of some of the 2016 um, campaign, uh, sort of the very targeted disinformation campaigns, the attempts to get people in specific cities to demonstrate protest, uh, turnout, uh, you know, make statements, etc. Um, those were very effective in many cases. Great, thank you, Molly. Um, it's a great, great kind of breakdown of it. Um, we have one other question that I'm seeing from Chris Murray, uh, and, it's, and it's a very good one. Uh, what are the next research questions you're interested in asking? If you could tease anything out of the 2018 data sets, what do you want to know? Let's say we could crowd Sorry, reading failure here. Um, what would what would we want to know? I think the, the bulk of the question is what are our next what are our next questions uh, to tease out from uh, the research that we've done here. Um, I think that's a 
it's a great question. Um, I don't know if Mindy, if you want to chime in on this or if, uh, if, if I should take a stab at it. I've, I've probably got uh, a pretty good answer for you. Okay, great. Um, so this is actually something that we're looking at as part of our disinformation project. Um, I think what we're really trying to get at is practical application of this stuff. Um, it's not so much uh, that we just want the data to, to play around with. We want to know how we're going to use that information in order to improve outcomes. So we've got a whole set of the electorate um, that has just been really mired in, in disinformation that is susceptible to disinformation. Um, and it's not just on the right either. You have plenty of people on the left uh, who are struggling with this as well. It's basic human psychology. Uh, I think it's a big part of how we surround ourselves with information bubbles and the social media sphere and everything. Um, so we, what we wanna do is we wanna find a way uh, to get into those bubbles, to convince people to, to open up um, to, to consider things from different angles and, and things like that. So as far as research questions go, um, I think that we're going to try to really work hard at practical application. Um, we're going to contribute a lot on this disinformation platform to recommendations on uh, how we can best involve ourselves in this space going forward. Uh, that's, I know it's a very general answer to your question, uh, but I think that that's where we're at right now because the data, uh, you know, as, as Adam was suggesting, is actually quite surprising at a certain level uh, that Trump, Trump supporters who, you know, a lot of people have sort of given up on as being able to reach, uh, were very able to change their minds in the face of different information. And I think that that's something valuable that we can take forward and use in our work. This is Mindy. One thing I would add is that in a very crowded information space, uh, one thing that we're quite aware of is that even if video content like that, which we've tested here, shows promising results, that would, in order to have long-term impact, we need to be able to understand how we do that. So how is this sustained? How do we sustain uh, the responsible skepticism that we're going for? In a crowded information environment where the same people that we're trying to educate are being exposed to you know, bots or uh, or you know other disinformation and just other content and and so there's a lot of um, you know there's there's short attention spans and there's distraction and so better understanding how we drive a sustained impact in a very crowded information space I don't know the exact questions, but determining that is, uh, is a goal for the next phase of what we do. Great, thank you very much, Mindy. Um, with that, we're just about at an hour, and uh, that's how much time we had uh, blocked out for this webinar. I wanna thank uh, everyone who came, everyone who participated. Uh, I hope this was very informative and, and very interesting to you. Uh, please don't hesitate to reach out if we provide any kind of supplemental information um, or if you have any other questions, thoughts, ideas, heck, we, you know, we're, we're interested in, uh, in all your feedback. Please don't hesitate to reach out to us um, with, any, with any comments or thoughts you might have. And, uh, and I, I especially wanna thank our panelists for participating today. Uh, Adam Schaefer from Evolving Strategies, Molly McHugh from uh, Fiona Strategies, and a board member, of course, to Stand Up Ideas, and Mindy Finn, our co-founder, and Greg Spenson, our policy and partnerships director. So uh, thank you all very much for participating, and I look forward to our next collaboration. Thank you very much. <laughs>